September. I think I probably should end here, see if there are any questions you would like to put to me. I, <clears throat> I think in the past a good lot, lot of what you're talking about has happened <clears throat> on our part and also on the part of other countries. We are through the worst period of it for ourselves unless we build up large surpluses and again return to a public aid program of the kind we had in the past. Most of you here don't remember much about it, but we did have public law 480 in which we gave grain away at very low prices to other countries, which certainly served as, as a disincentive for farmers in those countries. What we did was to export our surplus problem to other countries. There were some countries who were able to insulate what we gave them from the market and set up shops for just pure people, poor people and to use the grain we sent them for make work tasks where people were paid in kind if they worked on a project. They weren't therefore offsetting what they would have purchased elsewhere. And some people would point out that in Columbia, after our PL 480 program in Columbia, Columbia dropped its wheat research program and cut its acreage in half. A bit of the same thing has fallen over in Chile and of course we have the same thing with the EC and Francis wheat out in the market, the price of which. So it would seem at this time, point in time, people ought to become maybe intelligent enough. There ought to be enough good statisticians and actuarial scientists in the world that they could analyze weather and yield cycles a little more. And we could build some kind of a world, in Henry Wallace's term, ever normal granary or some kind of a world buffer stock but I don't know when we're going to get the world to all go in and build. Then I think that would be the opportunity that in norm, under normal weather, the farmers, producers in developing countries would realize what would be a reflection of the world market price. And in poor years, some would go out in the market and the price wouldn't be as high, but it'd be higher in other years. It's it's a thing which is, I think is capable of being done, but I think it's a world political question before we get that. At the present time, it seems to me to stabilize our market, it's almost up to us to build the storage and have the storage in the United States. The one who may cause world markets to fluctuate more than anything else may be the Russians but they don't seem about to build up that much reserve storage capacity in their country that they're going to let the brunt fall on other countries. But there is a big need. In my set of restraints I mentioned, I should have mentioned this as one, the, the policies of other countries too. It's not just the price policies of the developing countries. It's also the price policies of other countries. It's also problems of international trade, as barriers to trade. The developing countries get about half of their foreign currency through trade, but we do have so many of these barriers which even keep their product out, puts them at a disadvantage as compared to developing countries.
Russ? Yes, <clears throat> all the all the Asian ASEAN countries are are members, and each one has a physical supply of rice on hand. It's had to be identified, and you have to be able to go find it. And so they have kept it on hand, <clears throat> and <coughs> it is only fifty thousand tons. The reason is only 50,000 tons <coughs> is because Thailand is a large enough exporter that they expect they can get about 250,000 other tons out of the Thai, Thai supply on any one year. So it was a program which was put into effect about four years ago, and delegates of all the countries met and signed an agreement, agreed it how much each one is going to put in the stock. I don't myself remember which, how much each one puts in. And they went and examined each other's physical stock to see, in fact, the physical stock was there, that they were just weren't signing a paper, that it was there available in access. Now the Thais have written and said that there are about 25 other countries that would like to join this organization in terms of buffer stock. I think that's probably something down in the future quite a long ways, but there is this interest. So at least a precedent has been set that there is a small regional, rural regional buffer stock and other people are interested in it. I think it'll be quite a while before you really get the big powers, the United States, and Canada, and Russia, and Australia and so on. Maybe Australia will get interested in it fairly soon. Well, that could have some goodness about it and some badness about it. And I have heard cases where people have said, well, it's really the international corporations that are going, encouraging this sort of thing, <coughs> producing tea and coffee and rubber and cocoa and all those sorts of things, and buying it and so on and so forth, and therefore not producing food, producing those things and selling them and not food. So that could have its goodness or badness about it. Now, if a country had a comparative advantage in producing rubber or cocoa, and it could sell it to some other country and buy back more grain than it could produce on the same land, it had this kind of advantage, it would be better off to do so. On the other hand, if the distribution of income is such in this country that the people who really need uh, grain and staple foods can't buy it, and there isn't enough of a market there to absorb more grain production. But there is enough world demand for these industrial crops that they are produced and drawn out of the country. Then something is wrong there, that internally the country needs to do something about the distribution of income and the ability of people in the country to bid for the commodities produced and the resources used. Of course, that's a worldwide question, too. How can some people bid for the commodities produced? How can they bid for the world's use of resources? In the future and even now, there'll be no better example of that than petroleum. How can people in one of the most backward countries, one of the poorest countries, bid for the use of petroleum resources in the Middle East against, well, I like to explain it, that the Europeans quit building castles several decades back, but in the last two decades, the Americans really went into building castles. 
They put them on four wheels and they have two in every family and so on. And those people with those castles can bid for that petroleum in the Middle East. I say that's just an extreme example. The same thing applies to grain or anything else. It's going to take some world, world agreements of some kind, which are a little off stream to be able to solve these kinds of problems. Part of it exists within the country and part of it exists among countries. But I say that can be good or bad. I think that we are better off producing a lot of extra grain that we can't consume and sending it to other countries. That's their comparative advantage and buying back things from them. Some countries are better off producing industrial crops, selling them, buying back if they buy back. Could you give us a hint uh, about which countries are, are being hurt and are the ones who would bid? And which ones are doing okay? Are there any countries that you would buy, uh, advise them to grow grain instead of profit? Or give bid? Well, it depends on where they grow the coffee. If they grow the coffee. Are the ones you've been to, can you be specific? Are the ones you were? Well, I'm, I'm just going back and jolting my memory a little bit of the locations where I was and the land on which they were, were oh, I suppose maybe Costa Rica's as well off growing coffee where it does and selling it and uh, buying back some other commodities if I buy back the right commodities. That's probably true of Puerto Rico. Also, the, so the land on which they are growing the c coffee is probably their comparative advantage to grow it, ship it, get foreign exchange to bring things back. I've seen in Indonesia some <coughs> tea land which <coughs> looked to me like it was better for producing rice than some of the land I saw producing rice. It's maybe they've been better off. I think a person has to sort out the total comparative advantage of that. <coughs> But it's not all bad, producing industrial crops and selling them to get foreign exchange, if this is where the comparative advantage is. On the other hand, if it's some of these other difficulties I've mentioned here, the distribution of income and so on, then it needs another look. Oh, we've done some research on that a few years back. We, how, how bad would it be or what would the effects be if the United States decreased its meat consumption by a third and sent that much more grain out into the world? The United States could remain pretty healthy by decreasing its meat consumption by a third and eating some plant protein substitutes. All right, it might be, not be to everybody's taste, but it'd sure be a healthy nation. Yet, in doing so, and uh, what impact this have over the world, of course, that would probably drive the price of grain down a bit, whether it drove the price of grain down enough so that all the poor people in the world got it right now. My guess is the United States cut its meat consumption by a third. That grain would be sopped up pretty much by Japan, Russia, Eastern Europe, other European countries. That's where it would mostly go rather than to the poor, hungry people over the world. There has to be some other institutional channels to get it to these really hungry people in the world. I, <clears throat> I just mean not to keep the not to keep the price of food crops beat down for farmers, so that they <clears throat> are discouraged from innovating and using as much fertilizer as they could, or using insecticides. <clears throat> if we want them to innovate and produce, we want to keep their commodity prices upward and the price of fertilizer and so on downward. And I'm not averse to the government stepping in and helping keep these prices up a bit and keep the price of inputs down a bit till they get food produced. If they do it in a sensible manner, but now how about all these poor people that couldn't buy food if you had it even at the world price, uh, even had a common market, we tend to try to keep it above the world price and so on and so forth. 
we have a fairly workable system that other countries could either use that system or they could use some substitute for it. We have food stamps, and so <coughs> you don't really pay the grocery store price for the food. If your income is low enough, you get a subsidy for buying food. In India, they have used the fair price shops, isn't that the right name, in insulating these kind of foods off of the market so that the lower income people could have a chance to buy foods. A short time back, India was one of these countries that kept prices beat down, particularly the price of wheat beat down, two-thirds of the world price. They let it come up to a higher level now, a more encouraging level for farmers. So I think there are many devices, food stamp plans, various other types of subsidies. Well, who should do it? How should the burden be distributed? This is the way it was done in Thailand for a while. Price of rice went up, so you put on a higher export tax. That <coughs> decreased the export demand for rice. That dumped more back in the domestic market. That drove down the price for urban consumers. Who paid for it? Thailand's farmers paid for it. <coughs> so we had all of Thailand's farmers paying part of the food bill for all of Thailand's urban consumers. Well, there would have been more equitable means of distributing the cost of doing this. Maybe it would been better to let it sell in the world market for what it would and give poor urban consumers some food stamps or some red chips or something like this with which they bought foods. So I think there are much better ways than to keep the food price down. In Egypt, the price of food is so low for urban people of uh, wheat that farmers can go buy bread. That's what they kind of learned from the Russians, too. Because in Russia, you can go buy bread and feed it to your cow, and it's cheaper than buying grain. And that's also true in Egypt. You can buy bread and feed it to the cows, and it's cheaper than buying grain. So there's no sense in driving down the price of food that way. But you better have the market price, provide an incentive, use something else for the low-income people. There are lots of ways it could be methods to be used. We could even do what we do in the United States with butter and cheese. You see what we did with a bit of overpricing, and now if your income is at some level, well, you can go to the post office and get a pound of butter. Well, I don't think there's much to talk about there. It's just a matter of degree because every degree is kind of private sector and social sector, even the United States. The United States is about a third socialized, you know, about a third of the gross national product goes through. The, in Russia, not all of the people own their own knives and forks and spoons and coats and so on. They don't rent them from the government and so on and so forth. And